This video is on problem solving, but I'm not gonna give you 20 steps to solve problems well. Rather, I wanna talk about how to empower people inside your organization to become better problem solvers, both by training them to be good problem solvers and by training managers to create cultures around problem solving. I'm gonna start with a story that surprised me. We sent out a survey to Fortune 1000 managers and leaders. And when we did that, we asked a couple of key questions around what their desires were for their team. We were asking questions related to potential corporate training options that we offer or we're planning to build. And we had a hypothesis. We expected that they would come back to us and tell us that their people lacked analytical skills and that their ability to utilize data tools and programs was one of the biggest skill gaps inside their organization. And the results did not disappoint. That was in the top three, but it was not number one. And actually, interestingly, not by a long shot. In fact, the number one thing that organizations came back with as their key number one problem with their people was the inability to solve problems effectively. We were shocked. It wasn't a lack of data. It was knowing how to incorporate the data in a solution focused way to effectively solve problems. When this came to the forefront, we recognized that there is a two part problem. Organizations that have people that are staffed, that are ill equipped to solve problems and organizations that have managers that are ill equipped to train great problem solvers. And so we have a two part training process that addresses both of those. I'm going to walk through the three key steps of great problem solvers. I'm going to set down a couple of rules as I'm thinking about this. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about how to create a culture of problem solving. First, I just want to use an illustration that we talk about in some of our trainings. I think about this every time I go out to eat. There are really two kinds of restaurants and within each of those kinds of restaurants, two kinds of waiters and waitresses, two kinds of advisors in the restaurant environment. The two kinds of restaurants are menu based restaurants and restaurants that give you a set menu, a limited set of options. And the menu based options, the message is here is a list of things that I hope on which you will find a solution. And the recommendation options are the ones where someone says, these are the best things that we have on offer. The difference between the two of them is usually price point. The one is the Olive Garden, the second is the French Laundry. And the price that you're willing to pay to have a curated experience is often higher. Then in both organizations, you have different kinds of advisors that come to your table, the waiter or the waitress. And when they come to you, they say either pick something off of the menu or I would like to provide some recommendations. These are some of our most popular dishes. I tried this one recently and it was super incredible. And the other people who say, what do you like? Pick something off of the menu. The one that is clearly the more helpful is the one that is more directive in terms of limited sets of options. So just frame what we think about in terms of problem solving. We think about helping people become great problem solvers, primarily from moving from a menu based approach to a recommendation approach. And I'm going to talk about the three critical steps that it takes to do that. Number one, effectively identifying the problem. When we do assessments inside organizations on where the issue lies, this surprisingly to them is often the most important piece that's missing. Their people come up with great solutions, but poor identifications of what the problem is. Therefore, the list of solutions that they come up with often is a mismatch. So in a sales situation, this results in somebody offering what someone doesn't need or something that doesn't solve the problem that they actually have. In a client services situation, it results in people messaging the delivery in a way that doesn't resonate with the results that an organization was looking for. In tech development, it results in people building technology that doesn't fit the purpose for which it was designed. And so there's friction created inside organizations when the problem is not effectively identified. 
The second piece is that in effective problem solving, it's critical to identify a single recommended solution. Identifying not three, not two, not five, but one single solution retains power and ownership in a diffused model within an organization. It ensures that people themselves hold more responsibility the closer that they are to the data. So instead of passing the buck, if you will, there's by saying, here's three options you pick when you have the power, they say, I'm the closest to the data, this is what I would recommend and why. Finally, the third step in great problem solving is equipping your people to defend why the single solution that they came up with is the most effective one. They need to be able to defend it against objections from different key stakeholders. They need to be able to defend it by clearly articulating in our guidance 10 words or less why, not just what they recommend. And they also need to be able to think from the perspective of the people that they're delivering this to. So that's the three-step process. It's pretty simple, but it's actually really hard. So step number one is identify the problem in the right way. Identify the right problem. Number two is identify a single recommended solution. Number three is to defend that solution against objections. So we do a training and we have people come through it and they have remarkable insights, great clarity, tremendous process that the universal feedback is this was helpful. This creates a differentiation for me. One of the things, however, is that to create lasting change inside organizations, there has to be a different culture set in place. So when we do trainings that are focused only on the problem solvers, not the problem solving trainees, the managers and leaders of the organization, we find that there is often a gap. What happens is that people get really excited and they go off and they try this process and they bring a single recommended solution to someone. And the manager says, no. They do one of two things. They either say, go back and give me a different one without appropriate education, or they say, I will take it from here. Both of which are very unproductive next steps in the problem solving process. This brings me to a conversation that we had with the senior leadership of a large organization that we've conducted corporate training for. This organization wanted training for almost all of their people, but we were running a pilot. And they asked us, what should we set in terms of our expectations for how people will transform? They had a bet internally between two senior leaders. One believed that this would make their people faster, more differential, more effective decision makers. The other one believed that by nature, it would make them slower because they had to think more deeply about the problems that they were solving. And my answer was, it will be both. You need to set your expectations for approximately one year after going through a clearer, more focused problem solving training, you're going to have people that are slower problem solvers. And it will become very easy to think about how to abandon the process then, because your people, while they're becoming clearer, will have to go back to the drawing board multiple times. However, in the long run, you get people who are not just faster problem solvers, but clearer problem solvers, and they focus not just on solving the problems at hand, but also on the right problems. So you develop speed and power in the long run by going through this transformation. And what does it take? It takes a culture that is focused on failure. A, a culture that's focused on failure results in managers and leaders who ask people to retain ownership. They ask them to redo work and they help them solve which of the three steps of the problem they didn't do effectively. Just to drive this home, in the first part, if people didn't identify what the real problem was, then they can't speak to it. In the second one, if they present more than one option, it's important to empower them to go make the decision on their own what the single best recommendation is. And the third is if they didn't adequately defend with appropriate rationale or data what they are recommending, then you need to help them do that. Usually people haven't broken down on all three. And so training your people to figure out which one is the issue, sending them back to the drawing board on that issue and providing insight and scope to help them do the work themselves rather than pulling it into the manager's responsibilities creates powerful teams. 
Again, it takes about a year for organizations to transform from a culture of complexity to a culture of clarity. If you're interested in transforming the problem solving of your staff, as well as managers who are managing your problem solving staff, we would love to help. We've worked with Fortune 100 clients and small boutique firms that are focused on creating cultures of excellence. It's not a short process, but it will change the fundamental way that you operate, and we would love to help. To find out more, you can reach out to us at managementconsulted.com or by email. Thanks so much for watching.